Hey everyone, it's Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com and in this video we're going to be talking about cardiac preload versus afterload. And when you get done watching this YouTube video, don't forget to access the free quiz that will test you on preload and afterload. So let's get started. What is preload and afterload? Well these two terms play an important role in influencing cardiac output. And cardiac output is the amount of blood that this heart pumps throughout the body per minute. And it plays a very important role in maintaining tissue perfusion. So your heart takes the blood it's received, it's nice and fresh and oxygen, and it provides that to the cells that make up our tissues and organs. And our cells are very specific about their oxygen. And if they don't get a lot of it, they start to die. And the patient starts going through those stages of shock. Now cardiac output is calculated by taking the heart rate and multiplying it by the stroke volume. Now this is where preload and afterload come into play. And stroke volume is the amount of blood pumped by a ventricle with each beat. Because stroke volume is affected by three things. One thing it's affected by is contractility. And contractility is the strength of cardiac cells to contract slash shorten. Now we're not really gonna concentrate on contractility. Main thing we're gonna concentrate on are the other two factors that affect stroke volume. And that is preload and afterload. So let's talk about preload first. Now preload is the amount the ventricles stretch at the end of diastole. Now what phase of the cardiac cycle is diastole? What's going on during this phase? This is that relaxation filling phase. And we're talking about the filling phase of these ventricles are being filled with blood. So blood is draining down from either the right or left atrium. Your AV valves, your tricuspid mitral slash bicuspid valves are nice and open and blood is flowing down. And once they have filled, that is the part that we're talking about, the preload. So you can also refer to the preload as the end diastolic volume. It's that volume amount that is in that ventricle once it is filled at that end of that diastolic phase. So now let me illustrate preload for you. And to do that, let's use a balloon. So let's pretend the end of this balloon is our ventricle. And our ventricle is in the diastolic phase. So it's filling with blood. Okay, now we're at the end of diastole once it's filled with blood and preload is the amount that this ventricle stretched once it was filled at the end of diastole. So it's the end diastolic volume. Now let's talk about how we can increase preload and how we can decrease preload. Because if we increase preload, we can play a role in increasing stroke volume and this will help increase cardiac output. In some cases you might wanna do that, like with hypovolemic shock, your patient doesn't have a lot of fluid in the body. So we want to increase that preload to increase stroke volume to increase cardiac output. So one way we can increase preload is through the administration of IV fluids. And how that's given is that you stick a patient's vein with a needle, you leave a cannula inside of it, and it will drip fluids into the venous system. Now, what that's going to do is that's going to increase the blood return, the venous blood return to the heart. So if we're increasing blood volume that's returning to the heart, the amount of volume that is filling in these ventricles at the end of diastole is going to be high. So we're going to have an increased preload. Another way we can do that is through the sympathetic nervous system, stimulating that. And the body can do that naturally on its own, or we can give drugs to do that like vasopressors. And what happens in a nutshell is you have vasoconstriction, where those vessels are going to clamp down, they're going to narrow. And this is going to increase venous return to the heart. So it's the same concept. We're going to have more blood return to that heart. So that's going to increase the amount of volume that's going to be in that ventricle at the end of its filling phase. So we're increasing our preload. Now, how can we decrease this preload? 
where these ventricles aren't going to stretch as much at the end of diastole because sometimes we need to do that if a patient is in fluid overload like with heart failure we want to decrease their preload and one way we can do that is through the administration of diuretics and how diuretics work is that they will use the renal system and they will remove extra fluid from the blood volume and the patient will urinate that out. And a type of diuretic that comes to mind is like furosemide Lasix. So when we give that drug that's going to pull fluid out of that blood volume and it's going to decrease the amount of blood return coming to that heart. So if you don't have a lot of blood volume coming to that heart, that's going to decrease how much these ventricles are going to stretch once they're filled, hence decreasing preload. Another way is through vasodilation. So it'll have the opposite effect of what vasoconstriction have. And a drug that can do that is like nitroglycerin. And what happens is instead of having the narrowing of the vessels, you're going to have dilating. They're going to widen. And when they widen, that's going to increase blood pooling. And it's going to decrease the amount of venous return coming to that heart. So you're going to decrease the amount that these ventricles are going to stretch once they have filled. Now let's talk about cardiac afterload. Okay, this is the pressure that the ventricles must work against in order to get the semilunar valves open so blood can leave the ventricle and go either to the lungs or to the body. And cardiac afterload is really affected by vascular resistance. So if you have a high vascular resistance that that ventricle is having to pump against, that's going to increase its after low. And let me illustrate this for you and explain a little bit further. Okay, so we have our right ventricle and our left ventricle. And the goal of the right side of the heart is to get blood to the lungs. And in order to do that, this right ventricle is coming up against pulmonary vascular resistance. This is that vascular resistance I was talking about that it's, it's going to affect our afterload. So you have the right ventricle it has to open up this pulmonic valve, which is a semilunar valve. And once it's open, blood is going to be shot through the pulmonary artery, go to the lungs where gas exchange is going to occur. And very similar over here on the left side. Left side has to get this aortic valve open. Once it's open, it's going to go up through the aorta into systemic circulation. But here we have systemic vascular resistance that this left ventricle must overcome in order to get this aortic valve open. So let's pretend we have our ventricle again. And this is our left ventricle. And my fingers that are clamping this shut is the aortic valve, it's closed. And this part right here is the aorta. And it has vascular resistance in it, systemic vascular resistance. And the pressure of this is really keeping this aortic valve closed until this ventricle can overcome this systemic vascular resistance to open it up to pump blood out. So this ventricle must overcome that vascular resistance here. That's our afterload. So if we have high systemic vascular resistance increase, this is going to increase our afterload. It's going to increase the amount of pressure that this ventricle has to overcome in order to get this aortic valve open so blood can be shot out through the body. So let's talk about things that can increase afterload and decrease afterload. So increase afterload, when you have vasoconstriction going on, again, that's narrowing of those arteries. So if we have narrowing of the arteries that is affecting our systemic vascular resistance, or if we even have narrowing vasoconstriction that's affecting our pulmonary vascular resistance, that's going to increase the pressure that these ventricles must overcome to get these semilunar valves open so blood can go either to the lungs or throughout the body. 
And one thing that can increase afterload is pulmonary hypertension. And we talked about this with our congenital heart defects where they have increased blood flow that keeps going to those lungs. It damages the arteries that feed the lungs. They narrow and you get pulmonary hypertension. So if we have pulmonary hypertension, this is gonna increase the pulmonary vascular resistance. So that's gonna increase the, really that workload on that right ventricle. It's gonna increase the afterload because you have such a high pressure here and it's keeping this pulmonic valve closed. So it's gonna increase the afterload, the amount of pressure that this ventricle must overcome to get that semilunar valve open so blood can go throughout the system. And if you have a really high pressure, blood pressure going on with like um, vasoconstriction with systemic vascular resistance, that's gonna increase that workload on that left ventricle and increase its afterload, the pressure it must overcome to get the aortic valve open, to get blood, to systemic circulation. So afterload and vascular resistance really go hand in hand. Now, another thing that can increase afterload is a valve problem. So let's say we have our aortic valve, it's narrowed. We have aortic stenosis, narrowing of a valve. So we have issues and obstruction of outflow of that blood that's leaving that left ventricle. So it's really, this left ventricle is just having to work really hard to even get blood through this aortic valve because it's narrowed. So that's gonna increase the pressure that this left ventricle has to overcome due to that narrowing of the aortic valve to get blood throughout the body. So aortic stenosis can increase our afterload. Now, what's something that can decrease afterload? Well, a lot of times we need to give drugs to patients to decrease their afterload because their ventricles are exhausted. So we can give them like vasodilators, dilate that, that's gonna dilate the vessels out. It's going to decrease vascular resistance. So we decrease vascular resistance due to widening of those vessels. It's gonna decrease pressure and it's going to decrease the afterload because it's gonna decrease the pressure that that ventricle must work against to get that semilunar valve open so blood can flow out of the heart. Okay, so that wraps up this review over preload versus afterload. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to take the free quiz and to subscribe to our channel for more videos.